Hi, I'm Seth Bostead. I am the executive director of Access Contemporary Music. I'm a composer, and I'm also the host of the podcast, Relevant Tones. And I'm really excited to be here tonight as a lecturer for the Grant Park Music Festival. And I'm especially excited that the festival is able to go on uh, this summer in some form. I know it's a little bit strange, but uh, at least we're able to make music and, uh, and share music with you. And I hope that everybody watching this is, is safe and healthy, and uh, if you're protesting, please uh, be safe out there. So let's talk about music. On the program tonight is the Prokofiev First Violin Concerto and the Tchaikovsky Second Symphony. And whether that was by design or, uh, or happenstance, uh, both pieces are, I think, almost overwhelmingly joyful. Uh, it's true that the Prokofiev can be a little sarcastic at times. He had a biting sense of humor, um, but it's, it's not a, a sorrowful sarcasm like you would hear in Shostakovich. It's a little more playful in many respects, like a cat with a mouse or something. But overwhelmingly, it's joyful, and the violin is beautiful. For my money, this is among one of the most beautiful violin concertos out there. And uh, the Tchaikovsky, oh my goodness, this piece is is fabulous. So it's a great program. I think it'll, it'll lift all of our spirits, uh, which is fantastic. So I'm going to give you some oral signposts for each of the pieces. I'm very lucky today to have some clips of the actual performances, including the wonderful soloist Benjamin Bileman for the Prokofiev. So I'll give you a little sense of what we're about to hear and, and hopefully provide some context for you. Uh, so let's start with Tchaikovsky. He's second on the program, but he comes earlier in time. So I want to start with Tchaikovsky. And Tchaikovsky is born in 1840, lives until 1893. So he spends his entire life in the 19th century. And, and that's really important. Prokofiev, on the other hand, is born in 1891, lives until 1953. So he lives in the 20th century. Uh, so of course, we know the 19th century is different than the 20th century, but especially that's the case in Russia for, for many, many reasons. And that affects the, these composers. So we need a little bit of background on the time and place. Uh, Tchaikovsky was born in a, a very typical household in many respects at this time, a, a provincial household in Russia. Both of his parents played music, which was not uncommon in a time before Netflix. Uh, this was the only entertainment available to them. Tchaikovsky grew up playing music. He was quite good at it. But you didn't really go into music professionally at that time in Russia. It was definitely considered something that you would do only if you had a character defect or, or uh, if you had no other option available to you. So his parents were thinking, well, Pyotr, we think you should uh, become a, a civil servant. They wanted him to study jurisprudence, whatever that is, and become a civil servant. And uh, you know, you can only imagine what 19th century Russia was like if you've read your Tolstoy. Uh, every, every character is either in the nobility or they're a civil servant. This must have been a bureaucracy that would have made Kafka gasp. <laughs> um, so uh, they, they want to pack him off and become a face, faceless functionary you know, in, in the civil service of, of the Tsar Alexander II. And maybe that would have happened. I mean, who knows? He was a civil servant for three years. Um, but uh, Tsar Alexander II was an interesting figure, as, as czars go, one of the better ones, uh, one of the less murderous of, of the Russian czars. Uh, he, he's the one who uh, released the serfs from serfdom, so he's known as the liberator. And prior to this, you have to know that Russia, especially under Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, was really looking to Western Europe for models. So Peter and Catherine especially were importing architects, engineers, etc., to train Russians. And Alexander II was saying no. We're going to foster Russians. We're going to foster people within our own country uh, to do this. And, and so in the arts, that meant we're going to make a Russian art form. So when he dies, his aunt teams up with Anton and Nikolai Rubinstein, the famous pianists and composers, and they start the Russian Musical Society, the RMS. This is enormously important. You have to understand that Tchaikovsky is essentially at the dawn of classical music in Russia. Uh, before him, there's Mikhail Glinka, maybe 30, 40 years before Tchaikovsky. Before that, there's almost nothing. So Tchaikovsky is one of the people who's really helping to define what Russian classical music is going to be. And the RMS, and then later the St. Petersburg Conservatory, are at the heart of that. So Tchaikovsky is pushing pencils in the civil service by day, and by night he's taking classes at the RMS. He's taking theory, harmony, counterpoint, composition. Anton Rubinstein becomes a, a, a mentor, although it's, it's a complicated relationship, as are all the relationships in Tchaikovsky's life. And uh, he eventually goes to the St. Petersburg Conservatory. He's one of the first students. And a couple of things happen now at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. For one thing, the St. Petersburg Conservatory gets its authority, per se, from Western classical music. They say, we're going to teach you the same way that, you know, that Mozart and Beethoven were instructed. Uh, we're going to teach you the Sonata Allegro form. We're going to teach you these forms and structures that they use in the West. 
And the second thing is that because of that cachet, uh, you know, bestowed upon them <laughs> by borrowing Western forms, uh, it's now okay to be a professional musician. So Tchaikovsky can say, I'm not a civil servant, I'm a professional musician. Uh, unfortunately for him, getting this Western training, it's right when this Russian nationalistic idea is happening. And so in Russia at this time, it's a very popular idea. And Balakirev, who is Tchaikovsky's contemporary, um, he starts a group called the Five or the Russian Five. And they are kind of hostile to people who are still doing Western models. So Tchaikovsky is stuck right in the middle of this. And that is a defining characteristic for him throughout his life. He feels conflicted uh, professionally. He feels conflicted personally for many reasons that are outside of the scope of this talk. But this is a defining characteristic of Tchaikovsky. I bring this up because in the second symphony, we hear all of this. The second symphony has uh, the, the, the nickname, the Little Russian Symphony. And somehow he pulls off this miracle. He uses Western classical forms. The first movement has a wonderful sonata form, for example, in the faster part of it. Uh, but he uses a lot of Ukrainian folk melody. And Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire at that time, so they would have considered that to have been Russian folk melodies. It's obviously problematic now, but that's how they thought at that time. Um, and, and everyone liked this piece. It was popular from the beginning. Tchaikovsky played the fourth movement on the piano for a, a salon concert, and in his own letter he says he was mobbed by people. We don't know quite what that means, but, <laughs> but they loved the piece. And, and people love this piece to this day. So let's hear some of it. We're going to hear the, a little bit of the first movement. I'm just going to start at the very beginning of the piece, the first thing that you're going to hear. And the, the the melody that he's quoting here is a Ukrainian folk melody called Down by Mother Volga. Volga is a very important river. Um, so we're going to hear a little introduction. There are hardly any major works by Tchaikovsky. He's got a very dramatic sense um, that don't have a slow introduction, a kind of setting of the scene, as it were. And then we'll hear this melody first in the French horn, Down by Mother Volga. Here is Maestro Carlos Kalmar to conduct the Grant Park Music Festival Orchestra in a little bit of the first movement of Tchaikovsky's Second Symphony. Okay, that's a little bit of the first movement of Tchaikovsky's Second Symphony. The folk tune there is Down by Mother Volga. Let's turn now to the second movement. Uh, this is one of my favorite movements of all Tchaikovsky, actually. It's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous movement. There's really no slow mu music in the Second Symphony. Uh, this piece is a moderato. The tune here is called Spin, Oh My Spinner. I don't know of a folk tradition that doesn't have uh, a song about spinning in, in, in some way, shape, or form, meaning the, the loom to create uh, cloth garments. Um, so uh, we're going to hear it first in the strings, then in the clarinet, and then back to the strings. Now, this is not the beginning of the movement. This is about three minutes in. Uh, so I'm taking you, I'm giving you a little signpost within the second movement. This tune becomes very, very important later in the movement. Uh, so here again is the Grant Park Festival Orchestra performing Tchaikovsky.
I want to jump to the fourth and final movement here because uh, well, there's just so much happening in this movement. It's really fantastic. First of all, the Western form that he's using here is the theme and variations. If, if you know Beethoven's C minor theme and variations or uh, you know, Mozart's theme and variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, you take a theme and then you have fun with it. You do all these different permeations. And Tchaikovsky uses a, a uh, Ukrainian folk, tone, folk tune called the Cranes here. And uh, usually you sort of solemnly present the theme in the beginning, say, this is my material. And then you start to have fun with it. Not Tchaikovsky. He starts off right away uh, with, with, with a fast uh, kind of variation on the theme. And uh, boy, does he have fun with it from there. So even though it's a variation in the beginning, I still think you'll recognize uh, that, that it's a tune. And you'll certainly hear where it goes in the orchestra when you hear the whole thing. <laughs> So that's the piece that will close out the program tonight, the Second Symphony of Tchaikovsky. The program will open with the first violin concerto by Sergei Prokofiev. And uh, this is a fascinating piece. First of all, we're, we're, we're a couple decades later than Tchaikovsky. So uh, Prokofiev has been handed this legacy of, of Russian classical music. I mean, it's still developing, of course, but uh, what Modest Usorgsky, what Rimsky-Korsakov, uh, Tchaikovsky, Balakirov, Glinka, what these composers created, now um, uh, Prokofiev has the ability to, to, to move ahead with that. He's not worrying about creating a Russian classical music tradition. He can just kind of do his own thing. And on the other hand, there's Igor Stravinsky, uh, who is still very much in his Russian period in 1915 when uh, Prokofiev starts working on the violin concerto. So I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So Prokofiev does start to work on this in 1915, puts it aside, comes back to it in 1917. Uh, if I'm talking about Russia and I say the words 1917, I hope alarm bells go off. <laughs> that was a, a really rough year for many people in Russia. There was first a failed revolution in February, and then there was a revolution in October that, uh, that took. And, and so uh, everything was chaos. I mean, if, if you're a composer and you're trying to get an orchestra to play your piece during the Russian revolution, I mean, good luck, right? That's, that's not gonna happen. And Prokofiev is, is a, a fascinating individual. He's not a, a political person per se. Um, he's, uh, he's brilliant. He, he's a little bit arrogant. He's very much a, a self-contained individual. Um, and he says, you know, it seems to me, this is an incredible thing to say against the backdrop of all of this turmoil. He says, it seems to me that Russia is not interested in music anymore. <laughs> so it's time for me to leave. And, and he does. He uh, packs up all of his scores, including the violin concerto that he, he's completed, but has not been performed yet. Uh, he gets on the Trans-Siberian Railway, goes all the way across Russia, gets on a steamer, goes to Tokyo, as if he didn't just come out of, you know, this incredible, I mean, like a Jerry Bruckheimer movie where there's flames, you know, erupting behind him and he's running away from it. Um, he does concerts in, in Tokyo, you know, what, nothing. Um, and then he comes to uh, San Francisco where apparently the, the local immigration authorities uh, were suspicious of him. They thought maybe he was a Bolshevik spy and, and, and Prokofiev was kind of like, well, I mean, if I wanted to be treated this way, I would have stayed at home. You know, so so he leaves San Francisco, 
goes out to New York, and then he finds a card in his shirt uh, back in, in Petrograd, which is what they were calling St. Petersburg at this time. He had met a guy named Cyrus McCormick, a name I'm sure is familiar to Chicago audiences. Uh, Cyrus McCormick was a famous inventor. He's the, I think, the grand uncle or something of Robert McCormick, who will found the Chicago Tribune. And in, in, in typical American brash, nouveau riche, uh, industrialist style, you know, he likes music. He meets Prokofiev and he says, hey, if you're ever in Chicago, here's my card. Look me up. Uh, and incredibly, Prokofiev does. And so he lands in Chicago, has some successes there. And in fact, Chicago becomes very important to Prokofiev's career in many ways. And now Prokofiev's got his confidence back. He's feeling great. So he leaves. He goes to Paris, where uh, he meets Kusevitsky, the great conductor. And finally, the violin concerto is premiered. And it's a flop. <laughs> it's a complete flop. The Parisian uh, public is, they're not, they don't like it at all because it's too classical. Uh, again, in 1913, we had the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. So that's why I brought him up originally. Um, because uh, Prokofiev started out very much like Stravinsky, writing modernist music at the early part of his career, and then switching over to writing classical music. Let's start with the first movement. This is the Andantino. And what Prokofiev does here is he starts with this kind of otherworldly feel. He actually puts in the score that it should be dreamy, play, the, play it as if it's dreamily. Um, so let's hear that and then we'll go to the second section. So here is Benjamin Bileman performing with Maestro Carlos Colmar and the Grant Park Festival Orchestra. Isn't that beautiful? I love that opening. That's one of my favorite openings. Little tremolo strings, you can barely hear it in the orchestra, and then the violin comes in with this, this incredible melody, uh, a cross rhythm from the rest of the orchestra, by the way. It's, it's again this idea that Stravinsky pioneered of tying over the beat. You don't really hear where the beat is. It's absolutely beautiful, and my goodness, Benjamin Bileman plays it uh, like, like he's from another world himself. There's this huge climax, uh, you know, about two thirds of the way through the piece. And then the section that I'm going to play now, and then another big climax to, to finish it. So this is kind of, you know, sandwiched in between those two big sections. Uh, the violinist goes up very high and listen to this vibrato that Bileman is playing. I mean, it's, it's I don't even know how he's doing it. It's absolutely otherworldly gorgeous. It is so beautiful. And then the orchestra just goes into something, it's technicolor for lack of a better word. It's, it's, it's like you're in this, it's, it's like the orchestra was black and white and it turns to color. This is one of my favorite moments in the piece. So this is oh, about two and a half minutes before the end of the third movement. So here again, Benjamin Bileman, uh, Maestro Carlos Kalmar, and the Grant Park Festival Orchestra.
Okay, more music from the third movement of Prokofiev's first violin concerto. One of my favorite moments, my heart almost stops every time I hear that. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. And then it, it goes into this incredible climax. The audience gets to their feet. I hope that you do at home. I don't know how you wouldn't be able to. Um, so that is uh, what will uh, start the uh, concert tonight, Prokofiev's first violin concerto. And then we'll move to Tchaikovsky's second symphony. Again, it, this is joyful music to raise the spirit. I think we all could use a little bit of that right now. Uh, thanks so much for listening to my pre-concert lecture. I'm Seth Bosted, and enjoy the concert.